Thank you. <laughs> Greetings to all of you in our live stream worshiping community gathered out there in sacred cyberspace. Thanks be to God for this opportunity to yet continue as the people of God worshiping together. The Lord's promise remains true that where two or three of us are gathered together in his name, he is surely in the midst of us. So we greet you in the name of the Lord. I'm here with my wife, Deborah, who is off camera, and she joins me in greeting all of you. We want to express our deep gratitude for your pastor, the Reverend Dr. Paul Flores, the First Lady, Monica Flores, for this invitation to come back and share again in the worship of the Lord and in the celebration of God's holy word. Deeply appreciate your emphasis for the past several Sundays on the authority of God's word. And we want to continue along those lines this morning, speaking of the meaning and power of God's word for our lives today. And so let me call your attention to the scripture. <clears throat> today, our scripture is from the 119th Psalm. Psalm 119, verses 33 to 40 will be the text that we choose for our emphasis. The psalmist speaks and he says, Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep thy law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of thy commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to thy testimonies and not to gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities and give me life in thy ways. Confirm to thy servant thy promise, which is for those who fear thee. Turn away the reproach which I dread, for thy ordinances are good. Behold, I long for thy precepts. In thy righteousness, give me life. This morning, I offer you these words as a subject and, and a focus for our message, the authority of the Bible for your life and mine. There once lived a man named Lewis Wallace. He was a general in the American Civil War who fought alongside of Ulysses S. Grant in the Union Army. He fought against the Confederacy. He fought against slavery. He was also a lawyer, a politician, a diplomat, and an author. He even served for a while as governor of New Mexico. He became famous, but despite his fame, there were, there were two critical setbacks that haunted him. The first was at the Battle of Shiloh, where as a general, he suffered major loss of men to the Confederate Army. The second was after the end of the war, when he was on a train to Indianapolis. While on that train, he met up with a man named Robert Ingersoll, who was himself a Union soldier and commander. But his greatest claim to fame was that he was an atheist who traveled the country speaking against the Bible, speaking against the church, speaking against faith and God. Lou Wallace was not a churchgoer himself, and he did not have a strong 
religious foundation. He did not have a clear idea of who Jesus was or of who God is. So what little faith he had was quite shaken by his conversation with this eloquent and famous atheist, Robert Ingersoll. This left Lou Wallace feeling not only shaken in his faith, but also ashamed of how much he did not know about the Bible and Christianity. So Lou Wallace set out on a seven-year quest determined to learn everything he could about the Bible and Christianity. The result of his study was a deeper faith in Christ and a deeper knowledge of the Bible. But it also inspired him to write a book. And this book became known as the most influential Christian book of the 19th century. It was one of the greatest bestsellers of all time. The title of that book was Ben-Hur, A Tale of Christ. The book was later made into a 1959 movie starring Charleston Heston. And there was a remake of the movie in just 2016, starring Jack Houston. It is just one of those strange twists of history that a disturbing meeting with an eloquent atheist on a train resulted in one of the greatest Christian books of all time. It is also a testimony to the power of the Bible in the life of one man. Most of us in here know the frustration of being put on hold when we make a call on the phone. We might be calling to make a doctor's appointment. We might be calling to get an electrician to come out to our house. We might be calling to ask about a package that was supposed to be delivered today. We might be calling about a mistake that somebody made on our credit card bill. Regardless of the reason we are calling, it is just frustrating to be put on hold and made to wait when we're trying to get a problem solved or trying to get something done. Nevertheless, there are many people today who have put their very own lives on hold because they have not taken the time to discover the transforming power of the Bible in their lives. If only they had taken the time, they could have discovered joy unspeakable. But they've put that on hold. If only they've taken the time, they could have discovered that peace which passes all understanding. But they have put that on hold. If only they have taken the time, they could have discovered the love of God for them personally but they have put that on hold. In the 119th Psalm, we have the longest psalm in the Bible and the longest passage in the Bible. We don't call the units of psalms chapters because they are hymns, therefore we identify them by, by hymn numbers, but if this was a chapter, it would be the longest chapter in the Bible. It has 176 verses. However, the reason this psalm is important to us today is not because of how long it is, but because it is a meditation upon the power of God's Word. Now, the word Bible does not occur anywhere 
in Psalm 119. Instead, it uses other words like the law or testimonies or ordinances or precepts or commandments or statutes. It even uses the word word. But today we could also use the word Bible or scripture. For the psalmist, the word of scripture is the key to his deliverance and salvation. But the question is, how do we allow the Bible to become the key to our deliverance and salvation? It's not enough just to thumb through the pages of the Bible. It's, it's not enough just to look at the Bible. It's, it's not even enough just to hear somebody read the Bible. How do we move the Bible from our eyes and ears to our heart and soul? This is what the psalmist shows us. For he talks about what the Bible has meant for him in the midst of his own trials and troubles. One of the things we learn from the psalmist is that it is not enough just to read the Bible. We must also invite God to teach us as we are reading the Bible. Listen to what the psalmist himself says. He says, teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep thy law and observe it with my whole heart. What does the psalmist say? He says, teach me, Lord. It's not enough just to pick up the Bible and start reading. We need someone to teach us as we read. But what is astonishing is that the psalmist does not seek out a human instructor. No, he prays to the Lord God to teach him. Reading the Bible is not like reading any other book. We must have an invisible reading partner when we read the Bible because the words we are reading are the very words that our invisible reading partner has spoken. Sometimes we refer to this invisible reading partner as the Holy Spirit. He helps us to understand the words we read and makes them come alive for us. Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to send you another counselor, the Holy Spirit, who will instruct you in all things. And so the psalmist says two things. First, he says, teach me, Lord. And secondly, he says, give me understanding. It all comes from the Lord. Now, this does not mean that we have no use for human instructors when we read the Bible. We do have use for them. We do have need for them. In fact, there are some of us whom God has called to be instructors in the Word. But even we who are instructors in the Word, must also be taught by the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit must guide us in our instruction. The Holy Spirit must be present in our reading and in our teaching. And so the psalmist is doing something that is highly important for us. He is inviting the Holy Spirit to come and be his teacher. He is asking the Holy Spirit to give him understanding, and we must do the same thing. However, there is one thing I need to point out here. Many times when we read the Bible, the Holy Spirit does not wait until we invite him to instruct us. Many times the Holy Spirit invites himself. I know of cases when the Lord was not invited by the reader to instruct in the reading of the Bible, but the Lord came anyway. The Bible is a spiritual document. That is what sets it apart from other documents. When we encounter the Bible, we're also having a spiritual encounter. The Lord is just there. And when that happens, 
We must not resist the Lord's instruction. We need to lay aside our pride. We need to lay aside our selfishness. We need to receive what the Lord brings to our hearts. I remember that when I was preparing to enter the ministry, I read everything I could find about being a minister of the gospel. But when I finally became a minister, I had to put the books aside and learn to depend upon the Holy Spirit to learn things I could not learn from the books. All right. All right. And believe me, there was a whole lot that I had to learn. But those were my most valuable lessons. The psalmist bears witness that he too depends upon the Holy Spirit for his instruction. There is something else we learn from the psalmist about getting the most out of the Bible. And that is when we read, we cannot be afraid of change. The psalmist points to this lesson when he calls upon the Lord to lead him. He says, lead me in the path of thy commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to gain. Turn my eyes from looking at vanities and give me life in thy ways. When the psalmist prays that the Lord will lead him in the path of the Lord's commandments and give him life in the Lord's ways, the psalmist is acknowledging something very important here, and that is that the word of God requires a change in our lifestyle. Yeah, yeah. And quite frankly, for many people, this is the scariest thing about reading the Bible. Many have said to themselves, not out loud, but deep inside their hearts, if I read the Bible, my life might be changed. And you know what? They have a point there. Look at the ways the psalmist talks about how the word has changed his life. He says, Incl incline my heart to thy testimonies and not to gain. That means that the psalmist has turned aside from a life of, of greed and materialism. He will refuse the worship the God called money. His life is no longer dedicated to the acquisition of material things. For a lot of people, that would be a traumatic change in life because we live in a culture of greed, consumerism, and acquisition. What would happen if God and his word became our focus instead of the acquisition of money and stuff. Listen to another thing the psalmist says. He says, turn my eyes from looking at vanities. The word vanities or vanity, yeah, it's an old timey word, but what the psalmist is talking about here are things that we lust after. We see it and we want it. That is why he prays, turn my eyes from looking at, at vanities. He's, he's talking about eye lust. Today, the, I mean the Hebrew word is shawu, but, but today we might call these things addictions or obsessions or compulsions. A vanity could be anything, but what vanities have in common is that they consume us. And when they consume us, they take over our lives and lead us down to a dead end. The psalmist talks about how the word, how the Bible has changed this life because it has led him away from vanities. And that is a good thing. But for some people, that kind of change is a scary proposition. That is why many in the world today would, would rather live a self-defeating, self-destructive lifestyle than change. This is 
because the lifestyle they are living, although it might be self-defeating and self-destructive, at least it is familiar. Yes, it may be self-defeating. Yes, it may be self-destructive, but at least it's familiar. If I keep living the way that I'm living, at least I know that tomorrow will be the same as today. What makes change scary is that it involves the unknown. That is why living a life in the word requires faith. The only way to overcome fear is through faith. At the San Diego Zoo, there's an animal known as the gazelle. It has its own little section at the zoo. Actually, it's kind of down in a hollowed out space, and it has plenty room to move around in. But here is the interesting thing about the gazelle. The gazelle has amazing leaping ability. In fact, this animal can easily leap out of the space that it is in and escape down the I-5 freeway. But the tour guide explained to us that it will never do that because the enclosure that it is down in is so designed that the animal cannot see where it would land. And the one thing this animal will not do is leap without being able to see where it would land. The tour guide called it a psychological barrier. Therefore, bars are not necessary. Fences are not necessary. It's not necessary to put this animal in a cage because this animal will not leap without being able to see where it would land. Strangely, that is often the case with us as well in the situations that we are in. All we have to do is take the leap of faith and freedom will be ours. All we have to do is take the leap of faith and salvation will be ours. All we have to do is take the leap of faith and deliverance will be ours. Healing will be ours. All we have to do is take the leap of faith and blessings will be ours. But many of us will not take that leap of faith because we cannot see where we would land. We are afraid of landing in an unfamiliar place. It might be a better place, but the problem is it's a strange place. We've never been in that place before. The thing that holds us back is our fear. Fear traps us. One thing we learn from the writer of Psalm 119 is that we must not be afraid of change if we want to get the full benefit out of the Word of God. How do we allow the word of God to change us and save us like the psalmist did? Well, there's a third lesson we learn from the psalmist, and that is we just have to trust that God will keep his promise. The psalmist guides us to this lesson when he talks about God's promise. This is what he says. He says, Lord, confirm to thy servant thy promise, which is for those who fear thee. Turn away the reproach which I dread, for thy ordinances are good. Behold, I long for thy precepts in thy righteousness. Give me life. The point is, is that God keeps his word. And that is a good thing because the psalmist is depending upon God to keep his word. He says, confirm to thy servant thy promise. In other words, Lord, keep your word. I have pointed out that this 119th psalm is a meditation upon the word of God. But it's also something else. It is also something that we call a lamentation. A lamentation is a song of distress. And it is clear that the psalmist has reason to be distressed, discouraged, and disheartened. And all of these reasons have to do with how he is being treated by other people. Listen to what he says in this very psalm. He says, godless men utterly deride me. Godless men bespear me 
with lies. Godless men have dug pitfalls for me. They persecute me with falsehood. They have almost made an end of me. The wicked lie in wait to destroy me. But I have held on to your word. Every time the psalmist speaks about how his enemies have him surrounded and him then, there is always a nevertheless, there is always a however, there is always a but that involves the word of God. Godless men utterly deride me, but I have not turned away from your word. The point is, is that the psalmist has learned that God keeps his promises. He can therefore trust God to keep his promises. In the city where I live, there is a key maker. And I go to him whenever I need a key made. There are other key makers in town who are closer to my house, but, but I go to the shop of this particular key maker because I trust him and his team. He has never done anything to make me not trust him and his workmanship. My trust in him, in other words, is based on my experience. And really, that's all I need. But what about you? You, you can't go on my experience. You would have to have your own experience with the key maker to know whether he is trustworthy or not. I also trust God. And my trust in God is based on my experience of him. And that is all that I need. But what about you? You just cannot go on my experience you would have to have your own experience of God to know that he is trustworthy. What I love about the psalmist is that he knows that God is trustworthy based on the word and not only upon the word, but also upon his experience. One day a guy stole my wife's Bible out of her car while she was inside a convenience store paying for gas. He undoubtedly thought that he was stealing a purse because the Bible was inside a nice cloth book cover that had a handle on it for carrying the Bible. So to someone who's not familiar with Bible book covers, yeah, it would, it would look like a purse. And of course, my wife and I were not happy about this guy stealing her Bible. But on the other hand, All right. if somebody is going to steal something, there is nothing better to steal than a Bible. Because at least you would have the means for the transformation of your life right at your fingertips. All you have to do is open the Bible and read it with your heart. I mean, I would love to be there when he finally got to Exodus 20, 15. Thou shalt not steal. And maybe his life would have been changed. But evidently, he did not read the Bible because he never returned it. How tragic to be so close to salvation and then let it slip through your fingers. The great lesson of this 119th Psalm is that salvation and deliverance right at our fingertips, right, right. close at hand. Yes. We only need to grab hold of God's word. And so how do we avail ourselves of the transforming power of the Bible in our lives? How do we get the most out of the Bible in our lives? This is what the psalmist teaches us. First, we must invite God to teach us. Second, we must not be afraid of change. And third, we must trust God to keep his promise. 
then and only then will we get the most out of the Bible in our lives. As we conclude, if you're looking for God's plain, unhidden word, you have found it when you find the Bible. Yes, there are other ways that God speaks to us, he speaks to us in dreams, he speaks to us through other people, he speaks to us through nature, but his written word, the Bible, it's God's clearest and plainest way that he speaks to us. God could have chosen some other way to preserve and package his word, but he chose the Bible as the most reachable way to preserve and package his word. In the Bible, God shows us his character. In the Bible, God shows us his will. He shows us his plan. He shows us what he wants. Most of all, he invites us to walk with him. He invites us to have a relationship with him. The Bible is God's love letter to us. It is God's gift to humankind. Yes. There are people today who despise God's word. That is because God's word holds us accountable for wrongdoing. And many people just don't know, do not want to be held accountable for wrongdoing. There are people who despise God's word because God's word speaks against pride and selfishness. And many people have chosen to live proud and selfish lives. There are those who despise God's word because there's only one God in God's word and he is the ruler of heaven and earth. But there are too many people today who don't want God to be their God. They want to be their own God. Only those who love God will love God's word. Only those who serve God will love God's word. Only those who have humbled themselves and surrendered themselves to God will love God's word. And they will be blessed. They are the ones who will be blessed because God's word sustains us. God's word guides us. God's word illumines our path. God's word is the source of our strength. God's word renews our souls. You just cannot go wrong holding on to God's words. And I found out that God's word will hold on to you even when you let go of it. So if it's an answer that you need in the time of confusion, if it's an answer that you need, in the time of distress, look to God's word. Look to God's word. If it's power that you need to take up your cross and press on anyway, look to God's word. No, the Bible is not a book of fairy tales. The Bible is not fiction. The Bible is God and humans' record of God's encounter with human beings. Bible is the voice of God instructing us how to live. And so we can thank God for the gift of his word, the word that heals us, the word that transforms us, the word that lifts us up on eagle's wings. Thanks be to God for his wonderful word. Thank God. Amen.